It might seem strange for the Library Committee to have a talk on James Bond, as James Bond is known best to us, of course, through the world of films. But Fleming, when he launched James Bond, was obviously writing her novels, although from the outset he intended that these novels should earn him fame and fortune uh, from being translated till the suit to the silver screen. Fleming's papers are held in the Lilly Library in Bloomington, Indiana, and they're of interest in two respects from the point of view of books. First, the actual provenance of the collection. Um, Fleming in the interwar years, wealthy man, rather bored, um, decided that he would acquire the first edition of every work that had introduced a major new concept or discovery. Now most of these works were scientific, though there is, for example, a copy of the first edition of the Communist Manifesto. And these, uh, this collection was of interest to um, the trustees of the Lilly Library, a very wealthy library, and they attempted to purchase it from um, Ian Fleming. He refused to sell, he didn't need the money. Um, but after his death, um, he, the estate did sell them, and with that collection, which is worth looking at, uh, there also are the drafts of the novels. Now, if you look at the drafts, what strikes you very much is that Fleming, uh, like many novelists who, as it were, present themselves as people who can just do it, who casual gentlemen, um, actually worked astonishingly hard. There is redrafting after redrafting. Every single page is covered with extensive marginalia. And you can see through that how characters uh, develop, how the books are replotted, uh, how background detail and place are etched in. They're very impressive, they're important for our understanding of the books. As a novelist himself, Fleming, of course, was uh, a man who very much became identified with the particular forte of the adventure hero, but of course he did range more widely as a writer. He also wrote travel literature, uh, rather good travel literature, um, as indeed many other novelists noted for other things are done, even in war, for example. Um, he was responsible for Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, but he is best known, obviously, for the adventure stories. As literature, people will have their own views of them. They were famously attacked uh, in his lifetime by a rather acerbic uh, Paul Johnson. I think what one can fairly say um, is that they took forward uh, the particular type of, um, of fiction he was writing in a way that was very interesting. Several characteristics. First of all, for the 1950s, he presents women who are not defined by either uh, matrimony or motherhood. Um, the women tend to have sex with, uh, with Bond, and then some of them try and kill him, some don't. Um, the, but they are classically independent characters, albeit with highly improbable names. And this was very much different from the established interwar writing in which, although there were femme fatales, the, of the average female was there not as playing a central role. So that if you look at the John Buchan novels, particularly the Richard Hannay ones, uh, the actual emotional dynamo is between Hannay and Sandy Arbuthnot. Um, Hannay, of course, in the end gets married, but Lady Hannay is in effect an honorary man. She sort of does, goes in for country pursuits with her, with her husband. So there was a novelty there, and what it reminds us of is the extent to which the 1950s, far from being a rather static continuation of the 30s, and, and a continuation that is to be overthrown by the novelty of the 60s, which is the standard account, or a standard account. The 1950s itself was a decade of change and innovation. And indeed, we can uh, locate the Fleming novels in that uh, position. I'm going to try and do so in a second, but le let me first make one or two other comments about the novels as literature. Fleming essentially writes about places that he knows. So he uh, sets one of the novels in Japan, but he's been to Japan. He obviously spends his winters in um, the West Indies, so he can write about the Caribbean. He knows the United States. He knows the world of continental casinos. He does not range more widely than that. And that, I think, is interesting. 
Um, second of all, uh, the novels are written very tautly and tightly. Casino Royale, uh, Moonraker are written very much in a very brief period of time and with very restricting settings. And those give them an energy and a dynamism that is somewhat lost in many of the films, particularly the more recent films like the modern remake of Casino Royale, which sprawl uh, in both time but also in place. So there is a tightness in the writing and a specificity there, and that helps to link up with the actual um, dilemma. You know, there is so many days to save London in Moonraker before the Kent launched uh, rocket lands there, and so on and so forth. Um, like many novelists, uh, Fleming found it difficult to end his novels. There is a sort of rush at the end. Uh, often the ending is distinctly unsatisfactory, but he would not be alone in that. I mean, <laughs> Charles Dickens' novels very rarely end well. Um, so I think that whilst one can note that, one shouldn't hold it against him in particular. Now, if we look at Casino Royale, the very first of the novels, which came out in 1953, it's very much a novel about the here and now of intelligence. And indeed, um, it, what it captures is the degree to which uh, Fleming is writing against the background of anxieties and fears at that moment. The plot is essentially one about trying to stop communist subversion of the main trade union movement in France uh, because there is an anxiety that this will prevent rail movements uh, in the event of a Soviet attack on Western Europe, rail movements necessary for NATO forces. And although that might seem implausible to you, the CGT, the, uh, of course the French Communist Trade Union, was very strong in the rail, uh, rail industry. After the war, the Americans had in fact tried to uh, weaken trade unions, most particularly in France and Italy. And this is very much a novel of the here and now. And it relates um, not just to that in plot terms, but also in the trade craft, which is good. Fleming knew his trade craft, partly a matter of his personal background, but partly an ex the extent to which after the war he'd, uh, he'd kept up with it. Um, the other features of the novel which are interesting and are worthy of consideration is that he very much coins his own experience. There is no such place as Royale, but it's based on um, a merger, as it were, of Derville and Latouque, which he knows about. He very much knows about the world of the casino, that of course, uh, and of high stakes gambling, that of course recurs in, in Moonraker with the great scene set in the, London, the fictional London club. Um, and um, I think it's worth saying that Moon... Um, sorry, it's worth saying Casino Royale worked because it is actually a very good, taught and exciting book. It also encouraged uh, Fleming to press on, and it encouraged the publishers to press on. And one then moves to the second of the novels, which is uh, Live and Let Die, um, which comes out a year later. And Live and Let Die um, is very different in the, um, in the novel to the film. And indeed, it's, it's important at every stage to focus at the, uh, on the novels, not the films. Live and Let Die begins um, with James Bond arriving in New York. Now, uh, to us, <laughs> until the recent virus, that might have appeared almost an, uh, an everyday experience. Uh, but to most British people in 1954, when the novel came out, this would have been very unusual. In 1939, there had very briefly been scheduled services across the Atlantic. Those had obviously stopped during the war, eventually restarted after the war, but very expensive. And most British people, other than if they were taking part in uh, military operations in World War II, had not in fact tra travelled and had not travelled to the United States. So the description of arriving at the United States in the airport, which um, uh, of a sort of, of a, is really quite exciting, and then going into New York and what it is like, and of course the sense of menace there because of the anxiety about the potential for an atom bomb attack by the Soviet Union, which had recently weaponized not just its A bombs, which had moved forward onto the H bomb as well. 
and which was developing long-range uh, bombing. Um, so the, that uh, is captured. Now, the plot is one which, in some respects, is fantastical, but on the other hand, it reflects uh, Fleming's um, friendship with J. Edgar Hoover, and it reflects one of Hoover's anxieties. Hoover was convinced a man who made a career out of his paranoia, but paranoias are often bear some relationship to um, to reality. He was convinced that unless something was done, African American dissidents might well lead to it being exploited by the Soviet Union as an aspect of a type of liberation struggle. And it's incidentally worth bearing in mind that in terms of historical resonance, Hoover's argument, uh, which is one he'd been pushing for a number of years, plays a role. It's not the only role by any means, but it plays a role in the decision of, uh, of the American governments to move towards desegregation. Under Truman, you have desegregation of the army. Under Eisenhower, of course, you have desegregation of the schools and the dispatch of, of the airborne um, to uh, Arkansas to, as it were, overawe the National Guard because the State National Guard had been instructed to try and stop this. And under Johnson, of course, uh, you have the Great Society theme carried forward. Now, this idea is very much at the background of Live and Let Die. So in Live and Let Die, the notion is that there is a great criminal conspiracy um, involving African Americans, and there's an exchange between M and um, and Bond, in which Bond doubts this, and M says to him, "Oh, don't be ridiculous. Uh, there is no reason why." Um, Negroes, as he calls them, should not be successful in every walk of life as, as great scientists, as great achievers, and including as great criminals. Um, and of course, they do discover that there is this criminal conspiracy and that the Soviet Union is party to it. And that reflects a theme that you can see in some of the novels, not by any means all of the novels, but also in the films, which is the idea that Britain can have a role, not only on its own account, but also in helping to protect a threatened America from the challenge of uh, the Cold War, and in particular of Soviet action. And this, as it were, locates the arrival of Bond in the geopolitics of the 1950s. Um, remember that um, 1953, when the first novel arrives, is the so-called New Elizabethan Age, the uh, crowning of Her Majesty, uh, Britain, uh, Britain uh, still having uh, a very substantial empire, still having the second largest navy in the world, the third power to acquire the atomic bomb, um, the sense of achievement that surrounds things like the development of domestic uh, um, atomic power capacity, the climbing of Everest, etc., etc. And one can locate um, the Bond novels in part in that context. And within that context, James Bond appears as somebody who can save empire as well as somebody who can uh, have this role for Britain as an ally of the United States, which of course was the new geopolitical alignment. The British had played a key role in anchoring the Americans uh, in Western Europe at the uh, foundation of NATO in 1949. Britain had sent the second biggest contingent of foreign troops after the Americans to the Korean War in 1950 to 1953. Britain and the Americans generally, though not always, not over China, China, for example, aligned in the Security Council of the United Nations, of which they were two of the five members. So those points are worth bearing in mind, and they help to locate uh, Fleming's bond. Um, he is the saver of empire and sort of uh, plots like Dr. No, where at the end of the uh, plot, which is set on the uh, British colony then of Jamaica, and at the end of the plot, a British warship, the War Spite, uh, name recondite with World War II triumph at Narvik in 1940 against the Germans, and a contingent of troops which are presented as being run by a modern brigadier and not some sort of fuddy-duddy. All of these are to the fore. 
in in Diamonds Are Forever at the last scene, uh, Bond borrows a boffer's gun uh, from the British garrison in Sierra Leone to shoot down the, uh, the villain. So, you know, Britain is a presence round the world that it is worth thinking about. But it is also there as the ally to uh, the United States. Now, this um, sort of position in the novels changes, I think it's fair to say, from the mid-50s. Until then, and this remark might seem fantastical, but until then there had been a degree of location in the real world about the Bond novels. For example, in the beginning of From Russia with Love, real uh, Soviet intelligence agents are introduced in a discussion that they hold about um, how best to sort of weaken British intelligence. There is a setting of the here and now. Bond at the same time is taken part in a discussion about how to deal with Soviet infiltration of British intelligence, which is clearly located in the aftermath of the Burgess and Maclean um, scandals. Now, this changes in the late 50s, and the change can be seen very much in the plots, and I think it's fair to say in the, in the character and quality of the writing, but it is, can also be variously explained. As far as the plots are concerned, we move away from the source of villainy being Smirsh, Soviet external military intelligence, and we move to Spectre, a completely fictional, free-floating, extortionist and violent network uh, with a very interesting structure, which is introduced to us um, in the uh, uh, entry of uh, Thunderball, a fascinating example of political order uh, in its federal structure, but under a totally fictional uh, uh, individual, uh, Stavros Blofeld. And um, uh, Spectre appears in three novels. I think it's fair to say that they are implausible and they become uh, steadily more implausible. And You Only Live Twice, in which Blofeld dies, uh, is the most implausible of the lot. Um, so, And the quality of the writing also deteriorates. I think there's no doubt at all about that, that the later novels do not match the earlier ones. The only novel uh, after the first sequence that I would say is really exceptionally good, and that's because it's very unusual, is The Spy Who Loved Me. And what's unusual about that, and it underlines the quality of Fleming's literary imagination, is he writes it from the perspective of the woman. Um, uh, uh, Bond himself only appears after half the halfway mark, and uh, as an account written by a man of a woman's, as it were, rather rough-edged sentimental uh, education, it is quite an achievement in literary terms. But the quality of the writing is deteriorating in the later novels, um, and I think it is also fair to say uh, that the character himself is presented as in difficulties. From the outset, uh, James Bond had been, a, uh, as it were, on the darker side, a sort of romantic hero, capital R, under pressure. Um, and indeed, I think it's fair to say that Timothy Dalton is the stage actor who best captures that. But in the later novels, we are repeatedly told about his mental breakdowns, his need to go to see uh, the figure identified as the brain doctor, psychiatrist. And um, at the beginning of um, Man with the Golden Gun, uh, there is actually an attempt by Bond, who has been brainwashed by the Soviets, having had a breakdown, there is an attempt to kill by him M. And that reflects his not just his breakdown as a personality, but the fact that he's not fit for purpose for the service anymore. Now, the reasons why we, one might ascribe uh, these changes are varied. We might say that in part it's physical health. Uh, Fleming uh, drank extremely heavily. He smoked an enormous amount. The characteristic that photographs always show him chain smoking. He was a chain smoker. And like James Bond, uh, who is given very uh, strong Turkish tobacco, untipped cigarettes to smoke. Um, Fleming was not on the tipped side of smoking. He drank very heavily uh, and he ate, um, as it were, the sort of, I mean, he was very fond of scrambled eggs, for example. He certainly did not eat a diet that was uh, conducive to health. And of course, he dies as a young man, 56, um, uh, playing golf um, um, at Sandwich. Um, 
So you could argue that his growing ill health, and he'd had a heart attack, um, was part and parcel uh, of the decline of the character. You could argue that it's to do with his um, personal life. Um, he had uh, married uh, his mistress, uh, Lady Rothermere, after she divorced her husband. She had very expensive tastes, um, which put a pressure on him, um, uh, and uh, combined with high rates of taxation. Um, and um, the marriage itself was in great difficulties. Uh, she was having a long-standing affair with Hugh Gateskill, um, and you know, there's the story of him going to the French embassy and the person next to him, uh, for an embassy dinner, he was at that social rank, the person next to him saying, do you know that man over there? That's Hugh Gateskill, the new leader of the Labour Party, so that's 1955. And uh, uh, Fleming laconically remarking, oh yes, that's my wife's lover. Uh, the, the irony about this, of course, is that Anne Fleming was running uh, the major Tory salon, or she would like to think it was the major Tory salon in London, and there in the background was Gateskill, usually sitting there waiting to oblige her later in the evening. But um, I, this may, you know, Fleming may, being a cuckold may have depressed him, but I think it's fair to say, A, a lot of people were cuckolds at that period, Mountbatten, uh, Macmillan are classic examples, and B, he was actually playing the field himself. Um, so I'm not clear that one should necessarily argue that. I think it's more possible to take the line that Fleming himself was very depressed about what had happened to Britain after the Suez Crisis. Uh, he knew Anthony Eden, of course, um, he um, discusses in, um, you know, in his works this sense of Britain as drifting, um, and that becomes quite important towards uh, in You Only Live Twice as a theme. There is a discussion in which the uh, head of the Japanese Secret Service says, well, Britain's finished, uh, there's no reason for us to share any secrets uh, with the British, and Fleming rather um, is forced, or Fleming has Bond in a rather depressed way, defend Britain and try and argue that there's something still good about it. Although admitting that the Conservative Party and the Conservatives of the government from 1951 to 1964 are, you know, really as bad as the Labour Party. Um, so there is this sense of despair, and that might well be felt to have seeped into the writing. At any rate, the later novels are less good. Now, at this point, I think it's fair to pause. I'm going to do a sequel on the films, but may I just simply say that if you enjoy reading James Bond novels, of course, the vast majority of them are not by Ian Fleming. Um, the best of all is Colonel Sun, which comes out in 1968 and is written by a chap called Robert Markham. Robert Markham was a pseudonym for Kingsley Amis, a great fan of Fleming's work, a man who helped finish off um, uh, Man with a Golden Gun, and it's a rather impressive work, though it has a degree of dyspepsia about Britain, which is also can be seen in uh, Fleming's later, later Bond novels. Subsequent to that, I think it's fair to say that the John Gardner novels and the Raymond Benson novels were not particularly good. Uh, they took uh, James Bond through into the 2000s, We've had a number of novelists since, uh, William Boyd, obviously, Anthony Horowitz. You will have your own views of them. If you're interested, it's, they're worth looking at. But there's something about them that doesn't quite capture the achievement of Fleming. And to my mind, the central, f f the central failing is they're not taut enough, they're not short enough, and they're not compressed enough in both uh, setting, characters, uh, and time span. Thank you very much.